right, so um, we're going to jump into our third um, Lab Wednesday workshop of this month. And this month is all about our college app craze series. So what do we need to know to apply um, for our school? So today we're gonna talk about what it means for these schools to be test optional. Can you go back one? I'd love to. Um, so test optional, how do test optional policies impact my chances at college admission? And again, my name is Ms. Tucker and on, on our call we have Ms. Kittle and who you've met before but couldn't be here with us today is Ms. Ford, who's another EA of College and Career Readiness. So you're in for a treat. So let's go ahead and get started. So our objective for today, we're going to do three things. We're going to learn more about the role of the SAT and the ACT in our college admission process, particularly, particularly during this, this weird time of COVID, what do we need to know? Um, we're also going to work on debunking some standardized testing myths. So there's a lot of things that we're hearing right now, a lot of rumors about, um, you know, this test is coming, this test is canceled. I need to submit my test scores. I don't. So we're going to learn a little bit more about um, what this process looks like for us. And then lastly, we're going to round out by exploring the impact of test optional policies on our scholarship and financial aid um, practices and decisions. So these are some topics that we're going to cover in our agenda. So we're gonna first define what does it mean for a school to be test optional? Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about how COVID-19 has expanded the test optional um, policies and movement for, the school, for this academic school year. And then we're even gonna talk about some benefits of test optional policies. Like I said, we're gonna go into that activity about debunking test optional myths in a really cool um, interactive way. And we're going to talk about the impact of test optional policies on scholarships and financial aid and then round out with some next steps on how I can make my application count. Um, did you know that more than 50% and these, this statistic is, is probably even much higher than this now of all four year colleges and universities have now opted into test optional policies for fall 21. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, fall 2021 admission. So what that means is that COVID is really shaking up a lot of things as we currently know it, including that college admissions process. So it's very important that we're really in tune about what test and optional, test optional policies look like um, in, in higher education and what we need to do to be successful. So I'll pass it over to Ms. Kittle. Perfect. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we actually define test optional. So just briefly to go through this and then I'll summarize it again. Um, what test optional allows our students to do. Um, there are a number of academic pieces of information that you need to submit in order to apply to college. Um, some of that's going to be an application. It's probably going to be your high school transcript. It's going to be your test scores. It might be an essay, teacher letter of recommendations. Um, and what test optional allows you to do is to actually submit your college application and ask the admissions office officers not to take your testing into consideration while they're evaluating your candidacy for admissions. Um, and uh, that uh, can be um, both a choice that you make, um, the school might not require any testing at all. And what it does is it doesn't um, penalize you at all for your test scores. Um, and so uh, test optional is a really great option for any student that has, um, let's say a high GPA for a lower test score. Um, so if you're just not a good test taker, which was definitely, I know my circumstance, um, if you are a really hard worker and you have good grades, um, but you're just not a strong test taker, you weren't confident, you had a bad day when you take, took the test, whatever, have it be, um, what the school will do instead is they will believe um, that their philosophy is that we believe that um, what a student does uh, over the four years of their education is more important than what they do on a Saturday morning when they're taking the test or during SAT school day at school. Um, and so what they do instead is they, they put more weight on your GPA or they put more weight on other elements of the application um, and weigh the test score um, less or not at all. Um, and so uh, that comes uh, you know, synonymously with any time that you guys evaluate um, essentially uh, something that you want to purchase. Let's say that you guys have a dream car. Um, you all think about why you want that dream car, right? There's certain elements that matter to you in a Tesla over a Lexus, over a Corolla, whatever it is. Um, there's things that you guys value. Schools also need criteria in which to evaluate multiple candidates. So even if Morgan has 25,000 students who are qualified for admission, they can accept all 25 students because they don't have enough seats in their classroom. They don't have enough professors to teach them. 
Um, and so they have to make choices. And that's how testing actually was created, um, was because it was an element through which colleges could evaluate students for admission when they had a lot of students interested, but they couldn't provide seats for all of those students. But research is now showing that, and we're gonna talk about this in a minute, um, that testing is actually less and less um, of an indicator in the predictability of you being successful in college. And so the reason that more schools are adopting test optional policies even before COVID was because they've noticed that the work that you do in school, your high school transcript and your attendance is more important to predicting your success in school, um, in college, career, et cetera, than um, an SAT. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in a second, but just wanted to give you guys some background sort of on um, why they ask for testing um, and then why some schools have decided to, to shift their expectations. Um, obviously COVID has changed everything and all, all the ways of life. Um, and so for now, um, many, many, most schools in the United States are test optional just because um, equitably we can't expect students to take the test if you guys can't be in um, spaces or in schools with each other. Um, so let's talk a little bit about testing. So traditionally, you guys will hear about the SAT school day that we provide, the PSAT. You might have heard about the ACT. Um, and some of you might have even heard about the ASVAB, which is a lot of students might think if I'm going to the military or I'm interested in pursuing the military that I don't have to take a test. You actually do. It's called the ASVAB. So that's also um, included uh, in this conversation about testing. Um, but the SAT and the ACT are different tests. Um, and you don't study for them the same way because they're not testing you on the same information. Uh, so just some um, differences here. The SAT is out of 1600 points. Um, there is a critical reading, a math section that does ask for a calculator to be used and a section that does not ask for the calculator to be used. And then there's a writing section. The SAT is a little bit sh um, longer than the ACT. Um, and it costs a little bit more. I think it's like 65, um, but you guys are eligible for fee waivers. Um, and then the ACT um, is out of 36 points and it has a science section. So that's the difference. Um, so there's four sections. There's English, reading, math, and science on the ACT. Um, and it's a little bit shorter um, and it costs a little bit less. If you guys do wanna take the ACT, touch base with your school counselor to see if there's waivers uh, in order to take that. Um, the SAT traditionally, they changed a little bit. Um, they changed their questions a few years ago, um, but the SAT usually requires more critical reasoning skills. Um, and so uh, what that usually means is they will ask you to like read a text and then apply what you said to pick the best answer. Um, the ACT tends to have questions that more align with what you're learning in your curriculum. Um, and there's some research that identifies that students who um, were not born in the United States tend to do better on the ACT because it follows their curriculum rather than having um, contextual information um, that is not uh, as aligned with, with what you've learned in school. Um, Tracy, or more can I jump in really quickly? Are you able to go to the next screen? We're still seeing um, what this is. Oh, I am so sorry. Yes, yes, I'm so sorry. Um, so yeah, so these are just, again, what I had just mentioned, the outline of the ACT and the SAT um, and kind of how they are different. I just want to touch in the, does the military, great question, Kai. Does the military require the SAT? It does not. So it's called the ASVAB. Um, and I am, oh, so sorry. I am going to, Alexis, can you type in that ASVAB? What the ASVAB does um, is it's going to ask you a number of questions uh, that's relative to just basic literacy and math, but then it's also going to ask you some technical questions. Um, and so uh, a lot of students don't know this, but if you want to be an EMT or a medic or study health sciences, or you want to get a trade, you can do that through the military. The military is not just active combat. You actually have a career in the military and they will pay for that career training. Um, but the ASVAB exam is what is going to um, give you uh, an access point to the different um, parts of the military. So there's like the Air Force, there's the Navy, there's the Coast Guard, there's the Army, like there's different elements and your ASVAB score will identify which one you're eligible for, but it will also identify which field um, or which technical um, career that you would be best fit for too. Uh, and so we can talk about the military for sure if you wanna drop some questions in there, um, but I just want you guys to identify that that is still a career option. You do still have to take a test if you're interested in the military, 
but it's also going to ask you technical questions about like uh, tools, right? Like wrenches and whatever, um, automobile things, if that's what you're interested in. Um, and so it is a little bit different um, and you can, uh, you can study for that exam as well. All right, no questions so far. I'm gonna move forward. Back to you, Ms. Tucker. Thanks. So we just wanted to provide um, a few more details about how COVID-19 has kind of shifted all of our lives, including our, um, our test optional policies for the upcoming academic year. Um, so first things first, I want everyone to know that test optional policies, though they might be new to us, they aren't a new concept entirely. Um, colleges and universities have been practicing some test optional policy policies as early as 1969. So it was a while ago. My dad was born in 1969 and he's not super young. So it's been a while. I think the first college to do it was uh, Bowdoin College. Um, but what we have seen within the past 10 years was the, uh, the test optional movement has gained a lot of steam. And right now in our COVID pandemic, because we are limited to the spaces that we frequent and the amount of people, we're seeing those policies expand even more, like Ms. Um, Kittle said earlier, to ensure that there's equity. They, you can't be held accountable for tests or test scores if you haven't had the opportunity to sit for the exam. So we're shifting um, our practices around college admission um, due to our current circumstance. Um, and canceled SAT, as you know, the December um, test, December 5th, was actually canceled um, by the College Board. College Board is required by law to cancel testing dates in, according, in accordance with the government. And as you know, in the state of Maryland, we actually were, I think, shifted down to stage two again um, in our COVID, um, you know, practice. So I just want you to be aware of that. Um, thirdly, admission requirements. Having a test optional um, admissions policy will allow more students to meet some of the admissions requirements. So you have an even stronger chance. It can work to your benefit. Um, and one last thing to note is that some colleges and universities are even uh, thinking out of the box when they talk about um, college admission, you might see a lot of opportunities for video interviews or um, creative projects. This is a really great opportunity for you to share your goal, your, um, excuse me, your gifts outside of standardized testing. So why should I admit you to my school based on your grades, based on your extracurricular activities, and based on who you are as a whole unique individual? This is your time to shine. So I want to encourage you um, not to be nervous or anxious about uh, the inability to sit for a test, but to think outside of the box um, so that you can have the best chance of getting admitted to the colleges and universities of your choice. Perfect. Data time. He said, oh, he said data time or game time? Data time. <laughs> data time. Um, this is just a short graph that shows you guys the growth in test adoption policies. So as you know, I had just mentioned a little bit um, about uh, the number of schools who are seeing that GPA and attendance are better predictors of college graduation. Um, than test scores. And so you're seeing this rise. You guys are seeing history happen right now. It's going to be really interesting what happens after COVID because um, a lot of schools are like kind of panicking a little bit. Um, but we're going to talk to you about, I'm going to switch this over real quick, about this website called fairtest.org. Um, and it tracks all the schools that are test optional, that are test flexible, which means like you have to submit tests, but only like there's like a concoction of them. Um, but I did want to actually on this point right here. There was a really great question by one of our attendees who said, um, my father told me that if, if you got a high score, a score high enough, that you um, didn't have to have a high school diploma. Is that true? So that is not true. You always have to have a high school diploma or a GED. Um, however, what is, is accurate is that if you get a high enough score on an AP test, a three, four, or five at most schools, you don't have to take um, an introductory class. So if I take AP psychology and I get a four on my AP test, I don't have to go to College Park and take a, um, I don't have to take psychology 101. I can go right into like psychology 102 or something like that. And so um, I think that that question might've been geared towards um, how you can earn college credit. Um, there are also some nuances um, around test scores um, and waiving certain tests um, called uh, the um, test of TOEFL, the TOEFL, yes. Um, so if you uh, apply to College Park and you 
um, were in ESOL at all during high school, watch out for College Park. They might ask you for something called the TOEFL, T-O-E-F-L, the least test of English as a foreign language. Um, but that's another exam that they can ask for. Um, but yes, please go ahead um, for our uh, attendee if you want to reword that. Um, but I think that that's what might have been helpful. Um, some schools also will ask for the SAT too. There's like 10 of them. There's not many left. Um, it's usually the most competitive schools. Uh, and those are the ones that just need like, for example, Hopkins might ask you for um, additional testing uh, in the future or in the past because when COVID wasn't around because they needed additional things to qualify um, applicants, evaluate applicants on. Um, and so this is just a little bit of information about the number of schools who are allowing you to apply test optional. There's no questions about that. We can play a little game. Get ready, get your chat ready. We're gonna play some true and false. Let me get ready here. I gotta get myself ready. Stuck, are you ready for uh, to bring back Alex Trebek here? Absolutely. Oh, let me get the music going. So the way this activity will work is we have three um, test optional myths that we want you to, in the chat, I want you to drop if it's true or false. So Ms. Kittle's going to go through the myths and maybe just explain if you have any questions about it. Drop in the chat, true or false. Okay. All righty. Our first question is COVID-19 started test optional policies for colleges across the country. Is that true or false? And we can give you the answer. Drop it in I the chat, false. true or false. Dimitri says false. Kalia, false. Ella, false. Five seconds. Four, Jason says false. Three, Whitney says true. Two <laughs> and one. We What's cannot that? trick the crew here. The answer is false. COVID did not start test optional policies for colleges, although it did expedite how many of them have, uh, have gone forward with test optional policies this year. Test, policy, test optional policies have been around uh, for a very long time. Good work. All righty. Next, Next one. This is gonna be tricky. All colleges are test optional now. True or false. 10 seconds, drop it in the chat. Kalia says false. Ella says false. Well, Kalia said false with a question mark. Jason says false. Kai, oh, you guys are coming fast. Sasha and Javon say false as well. Five seconds. Whitney says false. Four, three, two. Demetri says false and one. What's that answer, Miss Skittle? It's Tucker. We had to have harder questions. The answer is false. Way yes, to go, guys. <laughs> yes. All right. Last one. Tell us if you think this is true or false. What's your belief system here? The college I want to attend is test optional now, so getting in will be a breeze. True or false? True or false. Ten seconds. Ellis says false. Jason says false. Kai says false. Five seconds. Whitney and Kalia say false. Four, three, two, and one. What's that answer, Miss Kittle? It is also false. Um, so as we stated earlier, oh, Jeopardy, Jeopardy's coming back here. Um, you are going to um, have other pieces of your application that are weighted heavier um, when, uh, when you're applying to a test optional school or you're choosing. So um, some schools will actually give you the option of whether or not you want to submit them. Um, and so I uh, just know that if you do choose no, um, that you want to make sure uh, that whether it's your essay or your junior brag sheet that you did or your letter of recommendation, um, that you supported your teacher with um, writing because you can actually help your teacher by telling them like, hey, I really like this about your class or um, I really appreciated this book um, that can help them write stronger letters of recommendation, um, especially if there's juniors on this call right now. You got to go to school. You got to keep those grades up. That's going to be a huge indicator um, for your likelihood of getting in. Same thing with our seniors. Um, and so uh, keep sticking out with that. Um, Ms. Tucker, back to you. Yes. 
So uh, before we end, we're going to talk a little bit about how can I make my college application count with the information that I have now about these test optional policies. So if we take testing off of the table, these are the things that colleges are looking at in our application. So they're looking at our college essays, looking at coursework and, coursework and grades, um, and they're also looking at our extracurricular activity or even our honors and achievements in school. So you want to be sure that you write an essay that is authentic and compelling and a true um, depiction of who you are as a student and in your college essay, you want to include um, facts and information that may not be reflected anywhere else in your application. So if you write a college essay, I don't want it to entirely be about I was the top of my class, I did this and this and this, I want to know a little bit more about who you are as a, as a whole person in addition to your academic um, and extracurricular background. So give me some personal examples, give me um, information that I may not have already found elsewhere in your application to make you stand out as a student. That's a huge piece of our college application process right now. If you need help with your college essay, um, there are plenty of places you can go, and starting with your um, school counselor, maybe an English teacher, uh, including our Navigator Center. We can get you more information about that. Um, so that's our college essay. Secondly, we're looking at coursework and grades. Colleges are going to examine your um, current grades. Your high school transcripts are really huge. So grades that you've earned in previous semesters, your overall um, weighted and unweighted GPA. And they're even looking at uh, what they call rigor. So how, um, you know, I don't say difficult, but how difficult or rigorous was your coursework? Did we take super easy classes throughout all four years of high school? Or did we take um, classes that helped to challenge and grow our academic capabilities? And they're weighing those, um, the rigor of your coursework up against other students at different schools. And lastly, we're looking at extracurricular activities. So in addition to your academic achievements and background, what else did you do to stand out as a student? Were you the captain of the debate team? Did you do um, cheer? Did you do any sports? Did you do any community service? What sorts of activities were you involved in outside of the classroom? And did you have any leadership experience that could help you to also stand out as a stellar student? And again, all of these things are completely absent of testing. Um, and the last thing that we didn't um, include is your letters of recommendation which um, your teachers, of course, will write for you, but you do have some power and autonomy in that process. Like Ms. Kittle said before, if you're a junior or senior, you're gonna be expected to complete what we call brag sheets. And that's an opportunity where you can tell your, you know, the teacher, whoever your recommender might be, these are the things that I'd love for you to include in my letter of recommendation. I was the captain of the, the um, football team, or I did start this really cool club at our school, or, um, my experience in your class has been this, and I learned X, Y, and Z, to kind of give your teachers a, um, a framework to, to do your letter of recommendation in. Awesome. So we have a little question in the chat, which I think is absolutely excellent. Um, uh, it asks, to get more attention, um, I have to do more challenging classes, already has two AP classes, and does um, NJROTC. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Tucker, if you don't mind, or I can do it towards the end here, we have a recording, um, a recorded webinar that talks about sort of this exact thing around like what our college is looking for. Um, and I think you guys, um, one thing I would love to see from every single person on this call is to give yourself more credit for what you're incorporating um, into your life as far as extracurricular enrichment. Um, because a lot of students don't think um, that leadership means taking care of a sibling, that leadership means um, being in the youth choir, that leadership means anything around a faith-based or volunteer-based organization. And so when you guys are writing resumes, you're thinking about what stands out. Um, don't think qual quantitatively just about numbers, right? I mean, your GPA does matter um, because what it does is it signifies to colleges that when you have an A in the class it, or you have a B in the class, um, it tells a college that you are accountable, that you probably showed up to school, right? Attendance matters. Because um, what colleges are trying to do, they're trying to basically predict your fit for that school and your likelihood to succeed at that school. Um, and so they want students who have good grades because it does, it's not just about the grades and knowing the coursework. It's about the habits that you also have that help you get those grades, right? It's your attendance, um, it's the collaboration, it's the group projects, it's handing in the homework, it's showing up the class on time. They're kind of reading between the lines a little bit. It's not just about the grades. Um, and you guys have also heard before in some other webinars uh, that you might have attended um, is that you guys would never want to um, have surgery by a doctor who only had a D and passed 60% of his classes, right? Like you would want to 
a surgeon that had an A and like you want like a 99% chance that he's going to do what he's supposed to be doing the right way. Um, and same thing with colleges, right? Is that um, if they're going to admit you into a biology program or into um, a social work program or whatever it is, um, they want to make sure um, that you have some fidelity and integrity in um, your grades uh, that will prove that when you do that work as an adult, um, that you uh, are proficient. Um, and so that, that, to answer the question in the chat, it's not necessarily about quantity um, as it is about quality. As far as classes, colleges want to want to see an upward trend usually. Um, and so if you took one AP class your junior year and you took two your senior year, that is signifying to colleges that you are someone who is into who is um, intellectually interested in challenging him or herself. Um, and it signifies to the college that you have made an attempt at um, pursuing college level work. Um, it also, again, if you get a three, four, five on that AP exam, it can also help you um, get into more advanced classes and kind of bypass some other courses. Um, and so, but same thing, if you took like all on level classes and then you took an honors class, same thing, you're still challenging yourself. Um, what colleges are also looking at on your transcript is like, hey, the student had like, three APs senior year and then took it easy because they finished all of their graduation requirements. That They're looking at your transcript to look for those trends um, as well. And so don't think so much about like, what does the what college wanna see, but really think about being authentic. Like if you love challenging yourself in history, but you like, don't really love math, like don't take AP math if you wanna take AP social studies or AP English instead. Um, pick classes based on what you're genuinely interested in. Um, same thing with like ROTC or clubs, um, anything like that. Um, that's really what they're looking at is who are you outside of the classroom? Give yourself credit for the things that you're doing. If you do hair on the side, um, if you have a family responsibility, again, um, all that stuff, if you have to work, that stuff matters too. Um, we have a question about, um, I go to a specialized school with a long school day and there aren't a variety of extracurriculars. Is there anything that can help me stand out? That is a really, really great question. Um, so just so you guys know, when your school submits your transcript, they're also sending um, a something called a school profile. And so what they do is they send that to your college and that tells the college how to evaluate your transcript. So for example, um, they're not gonna compare a student at City against a student at Carver um, because Carver has CTE programs and City has the IP program. Um, they're not gonna come, cause, cause, cause there is no, like let's take a school that has two APs. Let's take Poly and let's take ACE, for example. The Poly is going to send something called the school profile with your transcript. They're gonna say, hey, this student took um, five AP classes and we offer six. And at ACE, they'll send the school profile and they'll say, this student took one AP class and we only offer one AP class. And so what they're looking at is they're not looking at like the number of AP classes or the number of whatever, they're looking within the context of your school. So like, they're not gonna compare one student who has ROTC versus another student who has an environmental club when like they don't both offer, like they're not gonna compare, they're comparing apples and apples, not apples and oranges. Um, and so that's a really great, um, uh, emphasis just to make, but the question around how to make yourself stand out. Um, I think again, just like being a leader where you can, your grades and your attendance are going to say a lot. It's going to give you the most options for schools, for funding. Um, and so definitely you want to make sure you're excelling there. Um, like the college would rather see you have like a 3.0 and participate in three things that you really love than have like a 2.1 and participate like in a million things that you like kind of are committed to, um, if that makes sense. Um, but again, give yourself credit for some of those other things. Thinking about where did you get your service learning hours? Um, thinking about what are the, how are the ways that you spend your time outside of school? That could be paid work, that could be family, that could be faith-based stuff. Um, it could be a hobby that you have. Um, don't put value points on like one thing that you do is more important than other things. Volunteering is just as important as being on the soccer team or the football team or being SGA leaders. Um, and so again, make sure that you're just showcasing to them um, who you are and being authentic. I always tell students, you guys worry so much about being chosen. 
You are the chooser. I want you to remember that this is your process. You don't have to worry about being picked or being good enough. You are the chooser in this process. And so you can look for, there's 3000 schools out in this country, 3000 four year colleges. You will find one that is best fit for you. There's not one school, perfect school for everyone. You can have your dream schools. Um, but again, I just wanna make sure that you guys kind of move away from this idea of like, I have to be good enough and more into this idea of I'm amazing and this is what I bring to this school. And if they don't like me, then it's not a good fit. And this other school will help me um, help me grow and persevere. Um, so try to think about it that way. Um, anything else you wanna add, uh, Ms. Tucker? No, but I will be including what you just said in my gym drop today on my um, CCR social media, because that was amazing. I am the chooser. Everybody get that in your spirit. That's an affirmation. I am the chooser. Thank you. Of course. Let's see, am I off my rocker here? Let's, uh, how are we doing with uh, the next? Oops, so sorry. How are we doing? Okay, let's talk about money. So we also have on, um, again, I'm going to Say this one more time, we have a CCR um, uh, City Schools YouTube channel called the CCR Playlist. And we have, uh, we did a bunch of conversations around like financial aid and money and how to set up your FSA ID and your FAFSA and things like that. Um, we're giving out Under Armour jackets you guys haven't heard around FAFSA completion. So uh, hit us up, hit up your school counselor, see if you qualify for a jacket for completing it. Um, but specifically related to testing, um, colleges can give money based off of test scores. They can give it based off of um, GPA because those are considered merits. So school, schools give money in a variety of ways. One is going to be through taxes, through your parents' taxes um, or financial circumstance. And then another one is through merit-based um, qualifications. So if you have, if you, the school basically is giving you money to bring your talent to their school. That could be any talent. That could be your ambidextrous. That could be um, that you overcome a learning disability. If that means that you play the tuba and they need a tuba player, it could mean that um, it's not just about athletic sports. Um, and so in the past, a lot of schools would look at GPA and they would look at test scores and then they would give um, merit-based money to bring those talents um, to their institution. Um, and so uh, schools, again, will probably just weight uh, your uh, GPA and your transcript just a little bit heavier, um, but it's not going to disqualify you from merit-based aid if you do not have standardized testing. Um, and so again, as we have at the end here, and they also might think of um, some other avenues. So if a school reaches out to you um, and asks you for an interview, um, or some schools in the common application are asking you to upload like an additional essay or an additional portfolio or whatever pieces of information, um, they might be asking for that to substitute the fact that you're not getting testing um, and so that they can give out uh, that merit-based funding in another way. Before I move on though, any questions about money, college, Testing. Money? Is it money? Or money? She raised her hand. This is usually a pretty big topic. So we just want to make sure we give everybody a chance to chat. All righty. Moni, do you want to drop your question in the in the chat? I think you raised your hand. Can you drop it and then we can circle back to it? <clears throat> All righty. Okay, so she doesn't have a question. All right, to submit or not to submit? All righty. So um, some students are asking if I have my scores, should I submit them or should I not? Um, so here it says, submit your scores if you're satisfied with your overall score report and you feel that your score is a positive reflection of your academic abilities. Um, so what I mean by this is if I was a admissions counselor and I saw that you crushed the SAT, you got like almost a perfect score, but you had a 2.2 GPA, it's gonna tell me that you're lazy. It's gonna tell me that you are very smart, um, but that you're not working hard in your classes, that you're not showing up to class perhaps, that you aren't handing in your homework, right? Um, and so uh, again, it's always advantageous. A school would rather see you have really good grades and a low SAT score, or you can apply test optional, then they would like to see a high score and a low GPA. Um, because uh, work ethic matters and you can be a bad test taker, you can have testing anxiety, you can whatever. Um, but over the core of your, of the four years of your high school education, that is a very accurate reflection of the person that you are and how you've grown. 
if you had a real rough freshman year, but you got it together and you picked it up and you showed improvement over the course of your high school career, that says something about you, right? About your work ethic, about your persistence, about the fact that you you knew you had to make a change and you started asking for help or you started changing your academic habits. Those are signifying things to schools. Um, and so it's really up to you if you want to um, submit scores. Um, but again, um, highly recommend that if you um, have a very strong GPA, I would say like above a 2.8 um, and you have maybe 2.7 and you have a, a low GPA or low test scores um, that I would recommend that you apply test optional if you can. Um, and then again, don't submit if you're anxious or unsure if your score reports may distract from your academic story um, or if you haven't taken the SAT um, or the SAT. Um, and to emphasize your story matters so much more to schools than what your SAT score says. Um, and what we mean by story is just what makes you unique. I think there's a lot of students in Baltimore who think that like, this is just the way things are. So it's, it doesn't stand out, um, but this is a really special city and with really special students. And I think again, just like hype yourself up. Like you guys have seen and experienced and persevered things that like not a lot of people do. And you kind of just accept like, this is the way it is. Um, but within the context of Baltimore, how have you kind of found your shine, right? What gives you purpose? What could you talk about all day long? What are you passionate about? And it doesn't just have to be English, math, science, and social studies, right? It can be about um, civil rights. It can be about the protests. It can be about mass incarceration. It can be about whatever kind of sparks your interest. Um, but again, just being authentic to who, you're, who you are and your essay, um, again, needs to be about you. So here's the meat of of the pie here. So SAT dates, December was canceled. Um, we are in the process right now, um, working with the college board um, on negotiating, negotiating about a possible spring SAT school day. Um, and so you guys will hear about that, but again, don't stress out about it. It's tentative. It's gonna depend on what happens with COVID, um, but there are negotiations about uh, that in the spring and we're gonna be making um, decisions about a PSAT soon. Uh, and so if you are in lower grades, um, that is something that we're also talking through, but there's no firm date yet at the district level. Um, however, uh, there is free um, SAT online prep that's offered in the summer, the fall and the spring. So um, sharing is caring, please do pass it out uh, to peers, siblings, cousins, Whoever, um, you can go to this website and I believe you can sign up. Uh, in the past, Johns Hopkins also used to offer um, some testing too. Um, if anybody on this call has additional information about that and wants to drop in the chat, please feel free to. Um, but this, uh, this, these are a few options for you guys to study. I know you hear a lot about Khan Academy too, um, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys some options. Um, in the city last year, we offered um, testing and a lot of our students did see scores go up. And when you think about it, the SAT testing, you're probably like, oh, I don't want to do SAT testing. Um, but it's also going to help you in your in, with your grades in school, right? Practice is practice. Um, so someone asked, how would it look if we're going to do SAT in the school building? So the first questions that we're working on with the college board, because they're the ones that deliver the SAT, um, is about whether or not it's safe enough to even have the exam. Um, and so once that question is answered, we'll be talking about um, different protocols that would be put in place. Uh, so it might, you know, it might look like, you know, one person can use the restroom at a time, or we do the SAT test day over a course of two days. Um, or it could just look like, again, one of the reasons that it got canceled uh, last spring too was because like desks couldn't be far enough apart. Um, and so how do you handle all of those different uh, those different elements. And so that's kind of what we're thinking through. Um, what are the March and the May dates in 2020? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you, anonymous attendee. Um, so it's going to be March 13th, 2021 and May 8th, 2021 as well. Um, so thank you so much. And again, there's registration dates if you don't register by the deadline. So we see in February and April, there are frequently late fees associated, which you do not want. Um, but again, if you guys are really concerned um, about the SAT, you can talk to your school counselor. They're the ones that register you guys for school. Um, but again, I would be highly surprised um, if a college required SAT testing, even for students applying next fall, just because the option wasn't available to you this spring. 
Um, some students are deciding to take the SAT because of very competitive outside scholarships that are requiring it. So some scholarships will require you to have certain eligibility, like you have to be eligible for a Pell Grant through the FAFSA, or you have to have a certain score on the SAT or a GPA. And so I've heard that the students who are taking the SAT are doing it for that reason. Um, but again, put your health first. Um, and you guys, as a system, I don't think we'll be penalized if we can't offer you the test. Great questions. All righty. All right. I'm going to pull up fairtest.org. So you guys can go to Google. Fairtest.org is the gem of where you identify which school is test optional. Every single school, if let's say like you want to know if Morgan Coppin and UMES offer are test optional, you want to know if UMBC and College Park are, you can always go to the admissions website. Um, of the school and it will usually tell you they're not always super great about um, updating it, uh, but you should be able to find that information, but this is the most accurate um, list of schools that are test optional. So once you're here, you're going to go to um, college admissions and then you go down to optional list. And then there's going to be a giant list. Look at look how beautiful this is. All these schools, all these schools are allowing you guys to apply test optional. Be careful of these little numbers because there are code, the little exponents, there are um, footnotes, whatever you want to call them. There's codes. So like, for example, Colorado College, I think, um, is test flexible, which means they say you don't have to play, uh, submit all just all your SAT, but you can submit like your um, AP English score. You can submit the math section of your SAT and you can submit the writing section of your ACT. So they kind of just like let you mix and match. Um, but most of these schools, again, are test optional. All righty. Any questions about that? Hang in there. We're almost done. You guys are doing great. Ms. Tucker? Yes, I will round it out just with a quote that I really would like for you guys to keep at the top of mind. Um, like we said before, COVID is a weird time for us all, grownups too. Um, and I understand right now, you know, with this testing frenzy that we feel like very anxious, what's going to happen to my college application? Will I be able to go to, to Howard or to Bowie or um, UMBC? What's going to happen? I want you to understand that testing is only one piece of your entire application, your entire purview as a student. It's not the only piece that determines your admission. So as long as you, um, you know, follow some of the guidelines that we kind of gave you from this call, you do your best in your classes, you write a very compelling essay and proofread it with your English teacher, um, and you do all the things that you need to do, you will be fine. So um, I just want you to keep that top of mind. You can go to the next one, Ms. Kittle. Uh, we're going to drop uh, the survey in the chat in just a minute, but our upcoming sessions for next week, we have two that I really would like for you guys to be able to, to attend. Um, if you do not have class obligations. So next week, right before Thanksgiving, we're taking our first virtual college lab Wednesday tour to Bowie State University. And that will be at our normal um, 1245 college session time. And then immediately after that session at 145, we are partnering with the um, career and work-based learning team to give you a new session called Adulting 101. So we're gonna talk about how to build your academic and financial capital, which really just means um, draw the connection between your uh, GPA and your credit score. So how, what is the relation between those two things and how can we make sure that we do our best to have um, the highest GPA and credit score that we can, that we can have and do our best. So that's what next week looks like. Um, if you have any questions about that, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A or the chat. And then um, I think we're ready for the survey, Tracy. Awesome. While you so I'm going to drop it. Oh, go ahead. Go for it. While you're dropping in the survey, I just want to drop it in the chat. Um, the point about credit, just so you guys know, a little intro to adulting, um, we're not talking necessarily about credit cards, which are relevant, um, but when you guys want to take out a car loan, or you want to apply for a store credit card, or you want to buy a house eventually, your credit is a number that tells the bank what your interest rate should be. So if my credit score is 800, let's say, okay, let's say my credit score is 650, and Ms. Tucker's credit score is 750, 
she's going to get a better interest rate because she's considered more credit worthy, which means I would actually pay more money for the exact same car as Miss Tucker just because my credit score is low. And so what that um, kind of adulting 101 conversation is going to be about are things around um, the correlation between your GPA and your credit score. Um, and then also just an introduction to all of the adulting pieces um, that will uh, really help secure you a strong financial future uh, as well. And kind of all those other adult things in life that nobody tells you are important to know. And with that, we're going to go ahead and close out. Thank you so much for joining our Lab Wednesday session for today. Again, I am Ms. Tucker, and I have with me Ms. Kittle. And who could not be here with us today is Ms. Ford. She had a, another uh, very important meeting to attend. We worked together to give you some really solid co um, content around these test, op test optional policies and what it is that you need to know. So we really hope that you enjoyed. So give us that feedback in the survey. And I'll pass it over to you to say bye, Tracy. You guys so much for being here again make sure you fill it out because that survey actually goes to your schools so they then know you were here for attendance we talked about how important attendance is gpa is um and so uh make sure you complete that because that's how we let your schools know um and we will hang out here for another second um and then you guys are willing to sign off and this uh, are able to sign off and then this session will be available on the ccr playlist um, on youtube probably by next week if you want to share with friends or family. Thanks so much, everyone.